to myself. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? I, once again, I couldn't hear you over the loud applause of of the thousands and thousands of fans, but there's only 100 in here. It wasn't a start. It wasn't as many as usually are here. I understand that there are some that are still over listening to the broadcast at our affiliate Mormon Stories. Yeah. That, yeah, they must have <laughs> they must have done an impromptu show here. So Yes. Well, <laughs> we're, we're going on as scheduled, regardless. Full speed ahead. That's right. Uh, what's new and exciting, my friend? How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. It's rather cold here in the underground bunker today. And so I've got my wool overcoat on over my Ghost Rider t-shirt. Your wool overcoat over your Ghost Rider t-shirt. Is Ghost Rider DC or Marvel? Oh my gosh, you are so lost. I, it's like when you got excommunicated, the Holy Ghost completely left you. It, it did. If I'm honest, that's exactly what happened. The Holy um, Ghost Rider. Holy Ghost Rider. <laughs> the spirit of vengeance. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting ready to thrive this uh, weekend. Wayne Hepworth notified me that they had sold out all their tickets. So there'll be a full packed room of 300 people there ready wow. to listen to uh, the reels, the mounts and uh, Radio Free Mormon. Yeah, I better start thinking about what I'm going to say. I just wrote my talk last night and my wife was a little nervous because she's going to be standing up there with me and... So we talked about what things she wanted to kind of add to it, and I think we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, great. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing what you and your wife have to say, as well as the mounts. Sweet, yeah. And uh, folks, uh, Mormonism Live, here we are. It is uh, February 22nd, 2023. Uh, RFM, you're in charge of the show tonight, but before we get started, just wanted to mention to folks, uh, you know, it's the beginning still, kind of the first part of the year. Uh, we'd love to see folks join our team and become recurring donors. For those who do donate, we appreciate you deeply. Uh, but folks who are, aren't donating yet, if the Holy Ghost prompts you to and you want to support our program, go to mormonismlive.org, click the donate button. Uh, again, just a small donation would be great. Five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. If you're capable of doing more, uh, that'd be great. We have donors who, who do significantly more, but um, any little bit helps and we deeply appreciate it. And it's a great way to be part of the Mormonism live team and, uh, to help this show continue long into the future. The Holy ghost writer says donate to Mormonism donate. live. Do it now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, my friend, you've got a really interesting topic tonight. Well, I think so. Thank you very much. It's been put in abeyance a couple of times so far, but we're finally getting to it tonight. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a movie now it's two movies that a fellow named justin griffin has written and directed and put out titled who killed joseph smith the first movie came out i think it was around december of 2021 so a year ago last december and then just a few weeks ago in january of 2023 he released the second movie it's called who killed joseph smith part two and i think it's subtitled redemption and so I have watched both movies and I've looked at them closely. And the reason for this is because there are a lot of people who have been contacting me and wanting to know what I think about this and what's my take on it. And there have been so many people who have done this that finally I said, well, I, I guess we need to do a show about it. So I've looked at everything. I know you have as well. And when I watched part two recently, of course, it was only released. It was premiered in January and it is available on YouTube. By the way, it's Who Killed Joseph Smith. You can find it on YouTube. It's free to watch. I encourage everybody here who's interested in this, if you haven't already, or even if you have to go watch these movies in their entirety, because what we're going to be doing tonight is looking at it from a very limited point of view. It's kind of 
complex. It's kind of overwhelming with all the evidence, but there's one specific aspect of it that really caught my attention, especially as an attorney. And that aspect is in part two. Now, for those of you who don't know, the theory of Justin Griffin is that what happened at Carthage on June 27th, 1844, whereas we've been told by historians, uh, most of them with the church, what happened is that there was a mob that came to the jail and they stormed the jail. There were some who came up on the inside, uh, the staircase, uh, and inside the cell, which is actually a bedroom at the time where Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith are, as well as Willard Richards, as well as John Taylor, four people on the inside of this, this bedroom and mobsters on the outside and also on the landing. And there's a whole hailstorm of bullets going on. And John Taylor gets severely wounded. Willard Richards escapes without getting uh, injured at all in the crossfire. And of course, Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith are both killed by the mob. Now, this has been what has been passed on for, I'd say, 180 years now. It's almost 180 years since this occurred. And so what Justin Griffin's theory is, is that it wasn't the mob that killed Joseph Smith and Hiram. It was actually an inside job. Spoiler alert, everybody. It was actually an inside job done by John Taylor and Willard Richards, and that those are the two individuals who actually murdered Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith. So do you have anything you want to say about that first, Bill, before I go on? Just uh, two things. One is that I actually really enjoyed watching these. Um, it, I'm at a point in my life where it really takes something interesting in Mormonism to hold my attention. It has to be breaking news or some new historical development, uh, an episode that we're doing because I find that interesting. But th in this case, I really enjoyed watching these and I thought it was, it was they were well done. Um, I really appreciated uh, the ground he covers. And I think for at least some reasons, and I think we'll get into some of these tonight. I think he does open up ideas with evidence that um, would at least push back against the church's narrative. And for that, I certainly see this as having value and beneficial to everybody to take it in. And I would highly suggest that our audience and folks who view this later after we publish it after being live, if folks see this episode of us, you ought to go watch these two episodes of Who Killed Joseph Smith, part one and part two. And I think you'll also see that there is value uh, that runs up against the, the dominant narrative within Mormonism. Yes, I want to also say that Justin Griffin has really obviously put a great deal of effort, thought, work, money I mean, these movies didn't make themselves, and this expert witness didn't hire himself either. There's been a great deal of output on his part and trying to winnow through the evidence and come up with what he feels is the most plausible explanation for what happened. Now, I want to tell you at the outset, okay, I'm totally open to the evidence. If there's going to be evidence that this has happened the way he believes it happened with the third president of the church killing the first president of the church, which is basically why he got excommunicated. And he covers that in the first part of part two. I'm open to that, but I've got to tell you that I liken this to Martin Luther King Jr. getting assassinated, excuse me, by James Earl Ray back in 1968. And that is part of history. That's pretty much what people have agreed upon has happened. So if somebody, and this is not what Justin Griffin's doing, but if somebody were to come forward and say, no, I've got a different theory. It wasn't James Earl Ray who assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. It was actually one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s friends and fellow activists who was staying with him in the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. Well, if you're going to come up with a theory that's that radical, I'm going to need an awful lot of evidence to persuade me that you're correct. So I just want to make it clear at the outset, that's where I'm coming from. I'm open to the evidence, but if you're going to challenge history with a very radical subversion of history, then I'm going to require more evidence. And we'll get to what it is that I think about the movie. I will tell you that, uh, I may as well tell you up front, I am not persuaded by the evidence that is presented 
in either or both of these movies. That That is what happened. I can't say what did or did not happen. I think Justin Griffin would agree. He can't say for sure what did or did not happen. He's looking at different theories. He's trying to look at the ballistics and the different forensic evidence. And this is what really brings it into my bailiwick as an attorney and a criminal attorney for uh, 33 years now, first eight years as a prosecuting attorney, last 25 years as a private defense attorney. So I'm very interested in what's going on. And the thing that really caught my attention was in part two, where Justin Griffin engages the services of an expert witness. Now, actually, uh, Bill, you've got something from yeah. the part two, I think it is, where Justin Griffin is, is talking about how uh, he's very open to counter ideas or uh, I'll say constructive criticism. Yeah, and this is the part right here. I take any feedback to the film very seriously. I'm asking you to consider my point of view, so of course I'm going to listen to yours. Uh so essentially he sets the tone, which I think is beautiful, which is he's put all this work in, all this effort. He's got ideas. Um, he's got hypotheses about what's happened here. Uh, he obviously is passionate about it, but he says, look, I'm open. You're, you're taking the time to listen to my point of view. Uh, I'm going to take the time to listen to yours. And so we thought it would be uh, certainly welcomed by him. And I think interesting to our audience to tackle this topic, which you've really put the effort into uh, and for him to have a chance to hear what we have to say about his documentary and to see what we think about the evidence that he's presented uh, specifically with this expert witness. Right. And the conclusion that I come up with based upon the evidence that's been presented in both movies is that I'm going to come down on the side of the expert witness. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to yeah. focus on is his testimony, this expert witness, or at least what he says in part two. Now, I know there's a lot of editing that's going on. Uh, Justin Griffin had contacted me. He said there's about three hours total of this interview with the expert witness at the end of everything. And after the expert witness has looked at all the evidence for a number of months and gone through everything and come to his own ideas about it. And Justin Griffin says he'll be posting that up at his website in the future. And uh, so I know he has to cut it down and edit it extremely for release in part two, which is all that we have. But we're going to be looking at that. And do we also have uh, that first clip about uh, Justin? It's from earlier on in the part two. By the way, all these clips are going to be from part two of Who Killed Joseph Smith. And we will be presenting them in chronological order as they appear in the movie. But mainly we're focusing on the expert witness, which is really 10 to 15 minutes out of an hour and a half long movie. Yeah. Because I think the expert witness is the critical component of this. I'm not a historian. I'm not a detective. I'm not a part of any group. I just want the truth. Right. So he, he sets himself forward as a person who's not biased. He's not uh, after any particular agenda. All he's after is the truth. And I think that my perception is, by the way, I'm not trying to persuade anybody to believe one thing or another, because honestly, it doesn't really matter to me who killed Joseph Smith at this point. I think it's a very interesting question historically, but... I've got no dog in this fight. And he's presenting himself as the same way. My perception is that by the time this movie is over, what I'm seeing is that actually he does have a dog in this fight and he does have a conclusion that he is trying to reach. And we'll talk about that as we go along. And the conclusion he's trying to reach is the conclusion he starts with, which is that it was an inside job by John Taylor and Willard Richards. And I'll talk more about why it is that I think that. now. I also thought, I'm an attorney, I've had experience with expert witnesses, but since we're talking about an expert witness tonight, it might be helpful to have a person on who actually is and has testified as an expert witness in a number of very, very important and high profile cases. cases. So I reached out to my friend Randall Bell, and he agreed to come on and share his insights about what happens with the expert witness in 
this case, in the Joseph Smith murder case, if I can call it that. Do we have Randall Bell here? Let's do it. Let's uh, let's bring Randall on. Give me two seconds to straighten up the camera, and there we go. Randall Bell, how are you doing? I'm great. I I want to brag that I met Maven in person last week, so I'm I'm a particularly groovy mood. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Hey, Doctor Bell, could you just say in a thumbnail what your expertise is in? or your experiences in testifying as an expert witness, how many times you've done that in a couple of the big name cases you've done that for even recently? Uh, sure. I've been testifying in court since the 1980s, uh, in federal court, state courts, multiple state courts, international tribunals, uh, been retained in, um, uh, multiple by multiple countries, particularly the United States. And my specialty is in the field of real estate damage economics. So I want to make it clear I have no background in forensics uh, or ballistics uh, or, or those kinds of things. Primarily, my work has been in civil court, but I've done um, criminal court cases. I've worked on cases like John Benet Ramsey, OJ Simpson, the World Trade Center, uh, Flight 93, uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases. Okay, and those are cases where you've been qualified as an expert to testify in court and have testified. Um, I got to go one by one. Uh, I've been retained as an expert as, in all those cases. Uh, some I've testified, as you know, a lot of cases subtle. Right. So, but uh, I've testified, like I say, hundreds of times in various cases. Okay, really good. So what I'm going to be doing is tossing the ball to you as well as to Bill and Maven can jump in at any point she would like to. I know she's running all the, the stuff behind the scenes, um, but I'm going to be wanting to get your impression as to the expert witness. Now, what I just did with you was trying to lay the foundation for why it is people should give any credence to what you have to say about your background, your expertise. And in the movie now, as part of the introduction of this expert witness, whose name is Matthew Steiner, the movie does the same thing. And if we've got that clip, it'll show a little bit about him and why it is that we should take his opinion as something that uh, we should rely on, that he knows what he's talking about. Firearms are used at many crime scenes, so to analyze the evidence that's left behind is very important. So Matt Steiner is probably one of the most qualified and experienced forensic detectives in the entire country. Currently, he has millions of views for his trainings and for his critiques of crime scene investigations in different popular movies and television shows. I'm a retired detective with the New York City Police Department. I was a detective for 25 years in the crime scene unit. You'll notice more detail in that. I've program. investigated over 2,000 crime scenes, most of them being shootings. And that's what Sherlock Holmes is all about. It's all about the devil being in the details. And this is the basic founding principle of forensic science. We're looking for what's left behind. Yeah, this is just pure television, not reality. And one of the fields that they questioned was bite mark analysis. While I was learning everything I could about forensic investigations, it was Matt's videos that gave me so many new ideas about how to approach the evidence at Carthage. And eventually I got the idea to just call Matt and see if he'd be willing to do a review of the first part of Who Killed Joseph Smith. I got a hold of him and he agreed to do it. So there's the clip where we're introduced to the expert, Matt Steiner. And I've watched everything that's on the, um, the, uh, the rest of the movie with Matt Steiner. And I think that, Randy, you and I know that you can get a witness to say anything you want them to, an expert witness to say anything that you want in terms of if it's a person who has no ethics and they're just in it for the money. Yeah, they're sometimes called defense whores. You've heard that expression, haven't you? <laughs> I, I've heard it. Um, the other term that comes up a lot is uh, junk science. I, I'm in a fortunate position where I get more calls than I can handle. So I have the luxury of, of telling the truth. But um, <laughs> I've had the uncomfortable uh, reality of having to tell my clients I, I don't buy their case. And they fire or I fire myself and um, and they hire somebody who inevitably says what they want them to say. But um, yeah, that that's a reality of, of the courtroom. So I said that in order to say this. 
I got no impression at all from Matt Steiner that he's one of those kinds of people. He's a person who ha obviously knows what he's talking about. He's got a lot of history. He's got a lot of experience. He's got a lot more than I do, a lot more than you do, Randy, a lot more than Bill does. And that's why we have expert witnesses. So they can come in with this vast experience and education, and they can talk about issues that are beyond my ability to know about just based upon my own personal experience. You know, he's got a lot of experience. He he struck me as a credible expert witness. I I I would agree with you. And I just want to note the first, not the very first clip we played where he was asking us to give critical commentary and that he would take it seriously. But the second one where he um he and actually no, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the very first one we played, which he talks about the fact that he's not um uh uh, a historian. A historian. He's not an investigator. He's, this isn't his expertise. So Justin acknowledges at the forefront that while looking at this from an amateur level, he's doing just that. He's an amateur who's um, trying to figure out what went on there. And then his, by his own words, he is setting Matt up as a prominent, credible witness. And I think, I think this conversation works out best if we take both of them right at their word. Um, that that Justin isn't the expert that Matt is, and that the things that Matt tells us in this part two should be taken seriously. Yes, I agree. There's this other thing that isn't talked about, but which I strongly suspect is going on behind the scenes, is that Matt Steiner is not doing this for free. That he had to be paid minimum five figures in order to take two months or perhaps five months. There's a little bit of a discrepancy as to whether it's a couple months or five months. You will hear the different months in this, but for him to be this well-known and to be an expert witness in so many cases, and then to take the time it's gonna to take to go through all this evidence that's been presented to him by Justin Griffin, and then come to, I guess, wherever it is, Utah, and be filmed for this interview, is going to not be free. He's not going to be doing this out of the goodness of his heart. Your thoughts, Randy? Not only are expert witnesses paid, but that is an element that is disclosed in the courtroom. Inevitably, you get a, a question of how much have you been paid in this case? And uh, and yet that never came out in the documentary, but, but I would expect that, that there was no difference in this particular situation. Right. And there's some interesting things that happens because this sets up this interesting dynamic between Justin and his expert. This is his expert who obviously he's paid a lot of money to in order to get him to do his work. So what's going to end up happening is that we have an expert who's now going to be finally rendering his opinions after going through all the evidence. He's going to render his opinions on film to Justin who has paid him a great deal of money for this opinion. And that in, that creates this interesting dynamic of Matt Steiner wanting to protect his reputation. He's not going to say anything that he thinks is not true, but also trying to sugarcoat it as best he can when he's talking to the guy who paid him the money in the first place. Have you ever been in a position like that, Randy? Yeah, I, although if I heard some, uh, you know, if I was in the courtroom and I heard a statement like that, I would say I wasn't paid for my opinion. I was paid for my time. And there's a distinction there. Mm. And opinion is my own and it's independent of the amount of money I was paid. Uh, I was paid on an hourly basis to do the research. Right. And I think that that's definitely what Matt Steiner does, because once again, a spoiler alert, I think it's important everybody know where this is going. He's not going to support. Justin Griffin's theory. Absolutely. I've had, um, as, as I mentioned, I've had more than one, several cases where I've done the research. Um, of course, I know what the clients want to hear. And, you know, usually I'm pretty good at screening the cases up front so that we're, uh, we start off on, on kind of the same page somewhat, given my other experience. But sometimes in, in doing the research, you come across information that, that the client doesn't want to hear, they're uncomfortable with, that doesn't support their case. And it's essential that I have ethically a conversation with my client and say, 
here's the direction I'm going. Do you really want me to stay on this case? Because this is right. this is clearly the uh, the direction we're we're headed. Right. And I also want to give a shout out once again to Justin Griffin for <clears throat> allowing that opinion to be expressed in his movie in this part two. And we're going to play clips of that where his expert says he doesn't agree with him. And, and the we best his ex oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say the best thing his expert can say about Justin Griffin's theory is it's possible. Yeah. There, there's this thing, you and I know this, uh, RFM, Randy, maybe you've heard of it, but there's the thing called the criterion of embarrassment. And it's when something in the storyline happens that isn't what you expect. And it actually is a little, um, and, and I don't mean this offensively because it happens even in the new Testament with like John the Baptist, for instance, but the fact that his expert witness comes up with a separate conclusion, a different conclusion that is sort of contradictory, deeply contradictory to his position, that's not the position Justin would have liked the expert to come up with. So first off, kudos to Justin for continuing yeah. to let the expert state his expert opinion. But the fact that it contradicts Justin's uh, desired conclusion, it shows you also that um, that Matt is speaking his own mind. He's not influenced by whatever the funding was for this. Right. It gives credibility to Matt as a witness who stands his ground, regardless of what the person paying him would like him to say. And so the criterion of embarrassment adds credibility to what everyone is saying in terms of what the expert's stating and what they're making about it, essentially. Right. And there are a number of things that happen here as we go forward with clips. And once again, these are just clips. It's not the whole thing. Please watch the whole thing. And I look forward to watching the three hours of the entire interview uh, with this expert together with his report. Apparently, he created a report, which an expert normally would. And uh, Justin Griffin says he's going to be posting the report of the expert witness up at his whokilledjosephsmith.com website, I believe it is. It's not up there yet, at least not as of yesterday when I checked. So I'm looking forward to that. But what I want to say is that my sense is, is that the movie is constructed in such a way as to make the expert's opinion that he doesn't agree with Justin, but only that Justin's theory is possible, as well as a host of other potential theories could be possible, to turn that into a win for the movie. And we'll see what that looks like as we go on. This is just my take on it. And uh, once again, not trying to castigate or cast aspersions on anybody. This is just my opinion. So if we can play the next clip. After Matt completed his review of the film, I asked him if he'd be willing to do a full investigation of those two to three minutes in Carthage. And he agreed. Now, a lot of different critics of the film have said there is no way that the inside job theory would stand up to the criticism of a professional forensic detective. So we'll see. They might be right. At this point, I don't even know what Matt's going to say. It's taking him a couple of months to go through everything and then we'll get together and he'll present what he thinks is the best theory or what he thinks most likely happened. Okay, so I, I want to say a couple of things about that clip. The first is that's where we first get the couple of months time period. In a later clip, it'll be five months. But uh, maybe, you know, a couple could be used as generic for five. But that one, was it a, it was a screenshot of a text or something by some apparent critic, and his last name was blurred out. But it was highlighted in the movie that this critic had said to Justin that Justin would never find any expert witness who would support your film. Okay. That was highlighted in the movie. And I thought that was significant because the expert that Justin found did not support his film. The conclusion. All yeah, he the, says is it's possible. Right. Okay. So that's important to note because of something else that's going to happen shortly thereafter. Now, did you have anything you want to say about that, Randy or Bill? Well, I get that question all the time in court. Is it possible, Dr. Bell, that X, Y, Z? And the answer for that is pretty much always the same. And the answer would be, 
anything's possible. I mean, we, we may live in an altered reality. We may live on a flat earth. It's just not probable. Um, there's a burden of proof in court, whether you're in a, a criminal uh, courtroom or civil, uh, but usually the, the tipping point is 51% or better. And like I say, anything is possible. I tell my kids it's possible that purple monkeys are going to drop from the sky and give you $100, uh, but it's not real probable. So just saying that it's possible um, really in the courtroom setting is pretty much meaningless. Yeah. And just to know, this is kind of um, the thing that happens in apologetics a lot. And we talk about this all the time here on Mormonism Live. Whatever conclusion... It has the strongest amount of evidence, requires the least amount of allowances and conjecture. That's the most probable, most rational, most logical conclusion. Whatever conclusions there isn't uh, blatant evidence contradicting the possibility of that conclusion, that conclusion is possible, but it's not the most probable conclusion. And so it's easy to say that there's a host of things that are probable, as Randy's pointing out. But what we're looking for in this case is where the evidence most strongly points to. And it could be the church's narrative. It could be Justin Griffin's narrative. It could be the expert Matt's narrative. And it could be a host of 50,000 other things. Um, but what we're, but our job, if we're going to be rational thinkers, is to find the conclusion that uh, the evidence best supports, that the experts most align with, and that requires the least amount of allowances and conjecture. And if you do anything other, it's the way the apologist, Fair Mormon, for instance, sets up lots of situations where they create deniable plausibility and they try to or push even plausible you, deniability or plausible deniability. And they try to push you towards conclusions that aren't the most rational conclusion, but for which one person, a person who still wants to maintain faith could go like, well, maybe if we don't know. And then you suddenly can go like, Oh, I can still believe that we're, we want to play. We want to play not uh, loose with the facts here. We want to try to find what the expert and the evidence point to is the most rational conclusion. Yeah. Right. Oh, go ahead, Bill or Randy. Say quickly, you can sum all this up. The words you hear both with the uh, epistemologies and, and academic research, as well as in the courtroom is what explanation has the, and here's the three words, best explanatory value. And that's what you're on a search to find, which scenario has the best explanatory value. Right, and I believe that uh, Justin Griffin is trying to do that in his own way. And what I'm trying to do is I've looked at both movies. I have certain ideas about the evidence that's been presented, but I'm putting that to the side for tonight. And I just want to focus on Justin Griffin's own expert and trying to highlight exactly what it is he's saying, why he's saying it, and what it means, the words that the expert is using means. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted Randall Bell on tonight. Do we have the next clip? You know, respond to me. And I, and I talked about this case and if there's a chance for you to review it. And you say yes, which is amazing. And so I send you everything I have, and over the last five months, you've been able to go through the evidence and look at all the different reports and eyewitness accounts and you know, ask me anything or look at anything you want. And my understanding is, is you've come to a conclusion now. I've come up with my own theory, yes. Okay. Um, what is it? Well, I don't think you're going to like it. Okay. So what we know from this, what, what is it, Bill? Go it's, ahead. Um, let me, let me get rid of the, the thing here. So it's that to Justin Griffin's credit, he plays this dramatic moment where the expert witness is disagreeing with him and he plays it up, which I just, again, I give kudos to, I find it humorous because here's the guy who's putting all this time, effort, money into this documentary. He's paid money to this expert witness. And the expert witness says, I've got my own theory and you're not going to like it. And, and Justin has the kahunas to play the dramatic effect of that. And I just, I anyway, I thought that was quite entertaining. Well, I will tell you that one thing that we know, by the way, this is where the five months is mentioned. 
by Justin. So apparently the couple months he mentioned before is closer to five months when you actually count the number of months. That's a long time. And I doubt that the experts do a nothing but this for five months. Otherwise, it would be six figures instead of five. But it's a it's a massive amount of time. And what we're understanding from this is that the expert had all the evidence. He got to see the first movie that was produced. He got to look at all the evidence. He had total access to uh, anything that he might have wanted to see in order to come to his conclusion. And that was the next thing that was interesting, because this is an expert who, like all good experts, and I trust you're listening, Randy, uses his words very carefully. And Justin asks him, well, what's your conclusion? And the expert says, well, okay, it's not a conclusion, but I have a different theory. Okay. So he's not going to conclude anything, but he has a different theory and you're not going to like it. Well, there's a reason that he's not going to like it. And that's because the expert is not going to support Justin's theory, just like the anonymous text had predicted. He's not going to support his theory. But now there's the dramatic music. There's the cut to black. And then we're going to go backward in time, do a flashback to apparently what the night before was happening between Justin and his wife. They do a recreation of a conversation that they had apparently at their home. After getting the word from the expert that he's not going to like the conclusion or not going to like the opinion that the expert's going to render. So we'll talk a little bit more about that flashback when we play it. But Randy, did you have any comments about this part? Well, to your first point, RFM, yes. In the courtroom particularly and in a deposition and in the expert reports, words are chosen very, very carefully. Uh, words have big meaning. You can't be sloppy in, in your conversations. You have to be very precise because... Um, in both depositions and in the courtroom, there is uh, a person there who is literally transcribing every word you say. And those words, as you're saying them, appear on screens with both the judge and the attorneys. So I can see that uh, Matthew Steiner is a, a, a well-trained, obviously he has a lot of experience um, in, in the courtroom because as all of us uh, who work in the courtroom know, those words have to be very precisely chosen. Yes, right, right, right. That's so funny, Bill, because you you were going to say that I'm muted, but you yourself I'm were muted. muted. Yeah, yeah, look at that. <laughs> okay, so make a t-shirt out of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here's the thing that's going to happen, all right? Once again, I want to let you know what's going to happen because the movie is done in such a way with flashbacks and such that it's not immediately apparent the degree to which Justin Griffin's expert is undermining Justin Griffin's theory. Okay. So when we get to the point where there's, there's two possibilities. Okay. There's all these different theories that are apparently floating around to try and account for the evidence. Okay. And I didn't know that until this movie until so I thought that was great. I, I had no idea that there was this controversy that was going on among certain circles about exactly what happened in that uh, that Carthage jail upon that fateful afternoon in June of 1844. So I got to learn about that. But there are two basic things that could happen, okay? You've got either it's an outside job, which everybody has concluded up to Justin Griffin, apparently, or it's an inside job, okay? Those are the two main categories. And the way I'm looking at it, it's either an outside job. The mobsters did it. Uh, they shot Joseph and Hiram and they wounded John Taylor horribly. Or it was an inside job. And it was John Taylor and Willard Richards who were responsible for killing Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith. So what's going to happen now is that when we get to this part of the expert in the movie, he's going to give his own theory. And his theory is going to amount to, it was an outside job. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the very fact that the expert says, I don't have a conclusion, but I have a different theory. And his theory is it's an outside job. 
you don't have to do a lot of reading into that to know that the expert's theory is what the expert thinks best explains the evidence. It has the most explanatory value, right? So he thinks, the expert thinks his theory is superior to Justin's theory, as well as anybody else's theory, probably. But he has a different theory from everybody. But the bottom line is that his theory is going to be that it was an outside job, just like everybody else thinks, except for Justin Griffin. And, and it should be said here that, again, folks will need to go watch part one, go watch part two. But to recognize that even though Justin is disagreeing, I'm sorry, that Matt is disagreeing with Justin Griffin about what happened. He's got his theory, again, as an outside job. He His theory accounts for the evidence, and that theory does run up against the church's dominant narrative. Right. And I think that what's clear is that if you go through all the different statements that have been made about what happened that day, and if you go through the physical evidence, such as is still available, which isn't, you know, fantastic, because it has been almost 180 years, um, you're not going to find any one theory that's going to harmonize everybody because they're all over the place whether it's John Taylor and Willard Richards, who apparently have some things that they said, which don't line up with the evidence, especially with John Taylor's pocket watch. Um, but so there is no theory. It's going to count for all the evidence. So you've got to come up with a theory that best explains the evidence. And of course, the forensic evidence, as far as we can tell what the forensic evidence actually is, if that conflicts with a witness's statement, then as a general rule, I'm going to go with the forensic evidence. Because forensic evidence is usually more difficult to manipulate than a person's memory or their honesty. What are your thoughts about that, Randy? Well, I, I, I'm tracking with everything you're saying, and I, I haven't heard you say anything I would disagree with. Uh, Matthew Steiner is the expert. He's, I am not, you are not, nobody, uh, as far as I'm aware, on, on, uh, on the screen is, is a ballistics forensic expert. And so we have to go with his point of view because he has decades of experience in that field. And we have to respect that. And, um, and it's basically that simple. And, and I'll just add, there's been a ton of research done. I believe it was either Radio Lab or um, I can't remember. But there's a, a really popular podcast that went into deep detail about the research on this. Courtrooms tend to put a lot of weight on uh, witness testimony. But they, the research shows that witness testimony is actually the least effective mode for knowing what really happened. That, as you're pointing out, RFM, forensic evidence, for instance, is much more truth-telling when we, when we figure out what the outcome of the case is. Because as you point out, memory's faulty, Witnesses often contradict each other. If witnesses have any collaboration with each other at all, they tend to start to align their stories, not even knowing it. So if there's a group of 10 people and someone comes in to rob the bank and somebody says he was wearing a red jacket, even if he wasn't, other people in the room start to remember him having worn a red jacket. And so as, as you're saying, witness testimony is the least reliable, even though it has a lot of weight in a courtroom. Right. And I agree with you. I think you're correct, Bill. I just want to make sure to clarify and say that when you're talking about witness testimony, you're talking about eyewitness testimony. Correct. Right. Yeah, that kind because of you're pointing out that the early um, wit eyewitness testimonies of uh, Willard Richards and John Taylor have contradictions. The members of the mob are contradicting each other. So yes, eyewitness testimony. Right. So the other thing is this, is that what I think is that... Um, Justin Griffin says he wants to figure out what happens in this two to three minutes in Carthage jail when all this stuff goes down. And I think everybody would agree that what was going on in that room was absolute hell. And there's a hailstorm of bullets. There's a hundred different things and more happening within that two to three minutes. And all of them are violent. And so I think that to expect any witness who was present during that and recalling events later to somehow be able to come up with an absolutely immaculate uh, delineation of what happened in that room second by second 
And what was being experienced by all four individuals in that room is probably not realistic. Your thoughts, Randy? Well, again, I would agree. The uh, according to the documentary, and I have no reason to to uh, think otherwise. There were seventy three different accounts of the martyrdom, and and these were people who were literally on both sides of the issue. Uh, bullets are flying, and adrenaline is high. And in terms of the psychology, that we have three brains. There's the reptilian brain, which is at the base of the uh, spine the midbrain, which is the mammal brain, and the outer brain, which is the human brain. When you're in a traumatic situation like that, the outer human brain, which is where the logic is stored, turns off and you're, you're going basically on instincts. And so you have 73 accounts because everybody's thinking with reptilian brain in terms of just survival and getting through this, um, this mob scene literally uh, alive. And, um, and so memories are going to be understandably uh, distorted, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just human nature, and that's just nature's way of getting us to safety. When we return to our human brain and logic, a lot of those memories are repressed. They're forgotten. That's kind of, those are all characteristics of trauma. So, so in, the, in the traumatized situation that was going on in Carthage jail, um, there, uh, there, there's no question you're going to have lots of points of view and lots of contradictions. And that's why the forensics are really important. I just want to quickly add, there's two types of witnesses in the courtroom, percipient witnesses, which are the eyewitnesses in the bank robbery you just referred to. And then there are expert witnesses, which are looking at the economics or forensics or, or any number of things. And there's usually a distinction with, with, between those two types of, ex, uh, two types of witnesses. Right. And the other thing I want to say about uh, John Taylor and Willard Richards is that I fully expect what you said to be correct is that they're going on instinct for two, three minutes and for some time after, I'm guessing, until things calm down a bit. But I would also expect that in retrospect, they're going to try and make themselves look better. And if they are indeed what history has generally uh, mm -hmm. accorded to them, which is that they are both apostles in the LDS church. They are both close associates of Joseph Smith. They are dear friends of Joseph Smith that they're going to try and make Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith look better as well, that they are going to ascribe to them a noble death. For instance, this whole idea about Hiram Smith getting shot and exclaiming, I am a dead man has always struck me as somewhat overly dramatic and unlikely. Now, I wasn't there, but I wouldn't put it past John Taylor to put those words in Hiram Smith's mouth in order to make his death appear more noble. So I just wanted to say that much about uh, the difference in, in testimony, okay? But here's the bottom line, and I think the expert here, Matt Steiner, uh, understands this, is that these are all peripheral issues. They're all over here. And if you've got witnesses who say one thing about this or that, or you've got a watch that ends up not being shot on John Taylor, but actually may be broken on the windowsill. These are all peripheral issues that even if they're not correct about this, even if they're not telling the truth about it for one reason or another, that doesn't equate to, oh, it was an inside job then. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I see happening with a lot of people. Who are looking at this they're saying oh well this doesn't look right or this is wrong and therefore these guys are killers right yeah and, and you have 73 different narratives and that does not translate into therefore it's an inside job that the, the two don't track right and apparently the expert agrees with us so once again i'm going to keep saying that at the very beginning of this i said what my opinion is going to be on this is i'm going to come down on the side of the expert He's got a lot more knowledge than I do. He's got a lot more experience. He's looked at all the evidence through that training. And <laughs> I tend to agree with his conclusion. So do we have the next? Before you go to that, Maven, just really yeah. quick, RFM. The two best accounts I think we have of the martyrdom are both from John Taylor. One comes in 1854. It was written in Pittman shorthand. And it stops partway into the actual martyrdom. So as they transcribe the Pittman shorthand shorthand into readable English. There's some loss of information in doing that. And then 
it, it cuts off partway through the story of the martyrdom. And then the other one that we have uh, is a John Taylor martyrdom uh, account, which looks like it's dated 1856. So now we're talking instead of 10 years later on the one I just took off the screen, now we're 12 years later. And again, as we both know, and, and I will also say apologists love it when a critical testimony or witness statement comes much later because they'll point that out. We ought to note that the all, the same should also work against the church, that late remembrances often have uh, issues with being completely factual. And it's the 1856 account that ends up getting put into the Doctrine and Covenants, section 135, right, Bill, or at least part I, of it? I believe so, yes. Right, and it's obvious that John Taylor is lionizing Joseph Smith, especially Joseph Smith, but also Hiram Smith in that account. I mean, a name and a fame that shall not be slain. Not be slain. Right, and all that run. kind of stuff. Yeah. It's almost chiasmus. Okay, don't get me off track here. So are we ready for the next clip? Babe. Yeah. What if you were wrong? What do you mean? Well, what if the detective proves that it couldn't have been an inside job? You know, I'd have to admit I was wrong. I guess apologize. Okay, so once again, we're going chronologically through the film, but this is now a flashback that's inserted into the narrative after the scene where the expert says, you're not going to like it, okay, because I have a different theory. That happens chronologically after this recreation, because this is obviously something that happened like the night before uh, Justin goes in to meet with the, um, the expert and find out what it is that he's going to say. Now, what I sense going on in this scene and why it's important is because it's shifting the goalposts at this point. Right before this, we've got the um, that transcript or that screenshot saying that you won't find an expert who will support you, right? But now we have a scene where it shifts the goalposts, and the goalpost now is if the expert says it could not have been an inside job. What are you going to say? This scene must have been shot after the meeting with the expert. And so what I see is Justin finds out that the expert's going to say, not that he supports him, but just that his theory is a possibility among a bunch of other theories that could be possible, including the detectives or the expert's own theory that he thinks is better than Justin's theory. So what I see going on here, and I could be wrong, but what I see going on here is now trying to shift the goalposts so that it's okay that the expert does not support Justin's theory, but simply does not contradict his theory, which are two entirely different things. And I see this as a management of the story in order to make the expert not supporting Justin's theory, but just saying it's possible into a victory. And we should not expect there to be anywhere near sufficient evidence for anybody to be absolutely sure what happens. So it's sort of a straw man to create because it's essentially an impossible thing for a witness to have done the thing that he's, he's worried could have been done. Uh, to say that it could not have been an inside job to say that the expert would conclude, uh, would, would conclusively decide that this had to have been uh, done in any way, whatever his conclusion is to be done in any way that contradicts uh, Justin's conclusion. In other words, let me say it differently. Please. Um, he sets it up as saying like, what happens if the expert says I'm wrong, but as far as an expert can really go in this sort of situation is to go the evidence, lots of things could have happened. The evidence says this is the thing that's most likely, hence I have a theory. But what the expert's not going to do is do the very thing that he's worried about, which is say that you're absolutely wrong because there's this isn't the kind of case where you can do that. I'm going to throw that one to Randy. What do you think of that statement by Bill? 
Well, I, I, I would go back to what I said earlier. You have 73 different accounts and I liked RFM. You're, you're boiling that down essentially that it's a binary issue. It was an outside job, which from general appearances and as far as the narrative I always heard, that's what it was versus it was an inside job. <clears throat> and so you look at the you look at the forensics, you look at the 73 different accounts, which I don't pretend that I've ever done that. And um, and the expert who's worked on a number of homicides and um, uh, in a courtroom setting lays down their conclusion. And their conclusion is that it was an outside job. Uh, that's, that's the basic play. Most for- likely. Like the way he words it is most likely, right? Like this is my theory. It best explains the evidence, but how could we ever know for sure? Yeah, it has the best explanatory value. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the expert is actually going to look at other theories and say that he doesn't think that, he thinks that some theories are impossible that have been proposed because they contradict the forensic evidence. Okay. And basically these are going to be the idea that Hiram was up against the door with his face up against the door when the shot comes through and hits him in the nose. Right. And the expert's going to say, yeah, that doesn't, that's, that's not possible. We can X that out because if he was that close to the door, there would have been all this, uh, all the, um, the debris and the, the shards and the splinters coming through the door forced through by the bullet. And we don't see that kind of damage on Hiram's face. So he thinks that contradicts the forensic evidence. There's another theory, Uh, you know, you've got the bullet hole here, might be in the left side for Hiram and then coming out the other side. Well, there's two wounds, right? And Justin and the expert agree that that's one shot. Somebody else had proposed that there's two shots, two bullet holes, one here and one here, but there's no exit wounds. Okay, so it would seem then that the idea that there's two shots, if there's no exit wounds in the skull, is contradicted by the forensic evidence. So I think that they agree on that too. So we, we're in a situation where some some theories can be disproven by forensic evidence, but there's a whole legion of potential theories, which the expert will allude to, that are not contradicted and that could be possible. And Justin's is one of those. And yet the expert believes he has a better one, which he will explain here uh, shortly. Are we ready to go to the next clip? First, at the, at the evidence, the photographs of the evidence. I uh, was able to evaluate that yeah. and let that speak to me. Uh, then I, I watched your documentary, which was a, a great kind of overall of the case, going into the evidence, what witnesses were saying, current theories, and then at the end you came up with your own theory. It was impressive that you know having a group of people that were not experts in the field, yeah. that you all kind of approached the case in the same systematic, methodical order. You guys applied the scientific method too, which which is great. And you know, it wasn't just like, I think this is what happened, but not back it up with anything. Let's dive into the evidence. Okay, so now now they're gonna dive into the evidence. I just wanted to play that part because it does once again show all the work that the expert did in reaching his own opinions about what he thinks best explains the evidence. Did either of you have anything you wanted to say about that clip? Yeah, I just, I want to just add again, the expert is giving kudos to Justin for the way that he approached it. So while I'm saying Justin is self acknowledges, he's an amateur in this the expert is giving him the credit of having done this in a professional, thorough way, and, and we ought to honor that as well. Right. And I do note he also says that about the other people with the other theories that they've done. Right. He says that they have done that as well. And especially for amateurs, he's impressed with at the methodology that they have approached it with and some astute observations that they have made for amateurs that he's impressed by. And he includes Justin in that group as well. Yeah. Anything from you, Randy? Just that I admire Justin, that he is open to new evidence. I think that's a healthy approach, and uh, we're, we should always be open to new evidence. The, that being said, um, there's so much more that I was wanting to see that I didn't see when I watched the documentary. I'd love to read the expert report. Um, I would love to hear the three hours of dialogue that went on there. And I have a number of follow-up questions, having been to Carthage Jail a couple times and putting my finger through the door where the bullet hole was. 
there's a number of follow-up questions. And as you know, RFM, in the courtroom setting, there's cross-examination. So there's there hasn't really been an opportunity, at least presented in the documentary, as I saw it, for cross-examination. So there's still a lot of big components and moving parts that are completely missing. Okay, well, let's go to the next part uh, where they talk about theorizing. Theorizing. Okay. That's a big part of what you do, correct? Yes. You come up with a theory and you present it and people decide and they build on other things and compare it to, and they decide what they think happened. Go Again, ahead, saying that all, all, all previous three <laughs> theories have parts that we like, that have parts that, that are, are, are very um, astute observations, right. especially for non-experts. Uh, but all of them are impossible because the one that involves being shot through the nose at a door, we don't have any associated damage, so that X's that out. The other one, Sam Weston, that these are separate shots, right. no exits, again, impossible. But your theory, I, st I think, is possible. The first three, they're not possible. Mine is at least possible. Okay, so that's where the theory, the expert renders his opinion that at least Justin's theory is possible. And I see that, at, well, it's certainly better than it's impossible. Okay, so let's acknowledge that. But having said that much, saying it's possible is about the least significant thing an expert can say about anybody's theory. At least I think so. What are your thoughts about that, Randall Bell? I, I, I agree with that. The, um, the thing that kind of uh, didn't sit well with me with what Matthew Steiner has just said there is he X'd out, to use his term, if I recall correctly, he act, he axed out as impossible a few things, and that's where my thought about cross examination would come up because, you know, taking an absolute in the courtroom, saying words like all the evidence or all this uh, or axing out, any kind of absolute is generally um, frowned on or looked at with a lot of suspicion. Again, uh, the the context I normally see things and the world that I work in on these high profile cases, it's not a matter of what's possible. It's, it's again, what is the best explanatory value? So I, I would want to see Matthew Steiner cross-examined why he X those things out, because that seemed unusual to me from my perspective. And, and just to note one other thing, when somebody says your theory is possible, I think we all sense like, yeah, it could have happened. You at least don't have any smoking gun that eliminates your theory. But then that idea is weakened even further when the person saying that is the expert witness. They're the expert in the field. And they followed up by saying, and I have a better theory. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's everything we want to say about that clip. And the next clip is now uh, something else from the expert. This is possible, and then don't edit it down just to, <laughs> I agree with you, Justin, and everyone else is full of shit. <laughs> I don't, okay. I don't think you, you have proven this, but I don't think any of the theories can be proven in court. Okay. But I, I do think that your theory is possible. Okay, so he says, uh, and I think this is one of the things that's very endearing about him, is that he says, now don't edit this down to, I agree with you, Justin, and everybody else is full of shit. Why does he say that? Because he doesn't agree with Justin. He doesn't want to edit it down to, I agree with you. And he's going to go on to make it clear that he doesn't agree with him by positing his own theory, which he thinks is better. So, and I want to, once again, give credit to Justin for including that part in there, even though there's a hard edit right in between. But what he says is, look, yours is possible, okay? And he, re he repeats that. And that's about the best he's going to say. By the way, can we re replay that that one clip again, Maven? I think there was something else in there that I wanted to point out. It goes by pretty quickly. And there is that hard edit. There's at least one in there. This is possible. And then don't edit it down just to, <laughs> I agree with you, Justin, and everyone else is full of shit. <laughs> I don't, okay. I don't think you, you have proven this, but I don't think any of the theories can be proven in court, okay. but okay. Let's I, stop I do right. think that your theory is possible. It's possible. He says, you haven't proven this. 
That is Justin's own expert saying, you haven't proven your theory. It's possible, but you haven't proven it. But don't take it too hard because I don't think any theory can be proven at this point. Even if you got a bunch of theories that are possible, and he'll go on to talk about you know other potential theories that other experts might have if you wanted to retain their services. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of theories out there that could be possible, but there, you can't prove it. And you haven't proven your your theory either. Was there any uh, takeaways that either of you had from that clip? Um, it goes back to the earlier clip where he's sitting with his wife in the, uh, I think they're in the living room or in, in a room of a house sitting kind of on the ground. Yeah. And she's saying like, what happens if, if this, your theory's disproven? What if he says you're wrong? And in that last clip you just played, it seems to hint at what I was saying earlier, which is, this is so such an old case. There's so many witness accounts. They they contradict each other that what he's what his wife is fearful of essentially couldn't really happen anyway. This this expert isn't going to have the ability to just shoot it down and go. That's absolutely impossible. So there's always going to be this room, this room for the possibilities. And Justin's idea is one possibility amongst others. And the expert comes down saying it's not even the best possibility. Otherwise, the expert wouldn't have his own theory. Randy? Yeah, I, you know, listening to that clip again, it, it took my mind back to when I worked on the John Bonet Ramsey case. And that's a case that's never been solved. And that's very frustrating for a lot of people. I actually had lunch once with the lead detective and the uh, prosecutor. And we talked about the whole thing for about three hours or more. And this is this case is similar. We will never know conclusively. And I, I would agree with everybody uh, in the documentary that has said this will never be proven in court. It never will be. Um, but we have different theories and we have 73 different points of view from from people uh, that had uh, uh, some something to do with the event. But we'll never know. Uh, but. That all being said, it rises again to the best explanatory value and the inside job, I don't think, uh, is the best explanatory value, according to uh, the expert in this case. Right. So now we can get to the part where the expert, Matt Steiner, gives his theory that he thinks is the best theory, uh, presumably, otherwise it wouldn't be his theory of what happened that accounts for the evidence. And as you pay attention to it, and once again, credit to Justin for playing this, the expert's theory is different than the other theories, but it's similar to the other theories in that the expert's theory is it was an outside job. And he's not looking at it in terms of, oh, inside or outside. He's just trying to account for the evidence, but his theory ends up being an outside job as you will see as we play the clip. I think coming up my own theory is just another possibility and there could some, a third person, fourth person, fifth person could come in with another possible theory. And then I'm gonna rip you on yours if that's all right. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay with that? Or? Yeah, of course. I mean, it, if, be, I, if I can, I might not. I, I want you to explain any, it. Any theory then... has to be questioned. Okay. You know, if you're, if you're at a crime scene investigating it actively or doing a reconstruction later on, if you're not questioning every single thing that you say, you're doing it wrong. My theory is that we have the mob outside the door, we have our four characters inside the room, both pushing on that door back and forth. Uh, from all accounts, we, the mob doesn't know that they're armed inside. So maybe the first thought is, we'll just punch into this room, grab him and go hang him. Uh, and then at some point, maybe there's a conversation, who knows, but as that door is being forced open, we know that one shot hits the side of the door mm -hmm. and doesn't damage the door frame. So that means that door is at least partially open. Maybe that shot strikes Hiram in the back. And that's when he exclaims, I'm a dead man. Then releases pressure from the door and then someone else who's the outside with a handgun at close range, at what an intermediate range, not close range, close range would cause powder burns, but the intermediate range to say, I don't know this weapon, but say somewhere greater than four to six inches away, shoots, enters the, this side, and then exits to this side. 
uh, and then falls backwards. We see that there's spatter on the left shoulder of Hiram. So that could be from the exited mm -hmm. bullet traveling in that direction, carrying blood with it. Mm -hmm. uh, then falls on the floor, and then all the other shots come later on. It could be post-mortem, which would be explain why there isn't you know, completely saturated clothing and blood that would be harder to clean than maybe just small, some smaller stains. Right. Okay. okay, so push up against the door. You get shot in the back. Well, okay, so you the, can't there's enough like that because people are remember, pushing on the it's outside. It's a parallel shot to the floor that goes straight through, not so to the it, side. It hits. It hits the door frame. Uh, again, who knows? Maybe it, it's from a smaller caliber right. weapon. Is okay. less is right. less velocity, uh, and it slowed down a bit from going through halfway through that door, which is the thicker part of the door, not the panel, which is a thinner part of the door. Absolutely. And uh, then strikes him in the back, and then now the pressure of Hiram pressing against him is no longer there. Doors open even further, and then someone reaches in from the outside, gets that shot, enters here, and then exits out the side of his nose. Got it. Okay, so that's the expert's theory for what accounts for it. And as he says, you know, you could get a line of experts from here to the moon who could come in and look at this evidence and give you different possible theories. This is the one that I'm giving which, by the way, means to me, this is the one that I favor because I think this is the most likely. And yet what he's describing is an outside job. Bill, what do you think? E, so I'd always learned the story that, you know, the, the hole in the door. You go to Carthage Jail and I've been there. Uh, there's the hole in the door. And by the way, there's a blood spot, you know, further back in the room on the ground. And we now know that the church would intentionally... Uh, add coloring to the floor to make that blood spot more prominent so that folks, whenever they visited Carthage, by the way, true fact, whenever people would visit Carthage jail, they would see the blood spot. But uh, they, there is evidence, strong evidence that the uh, senior missionaries who served there were instructed by the church to go through every once in a while and make that blood spot more prominent. So the hole in the Carthage door I was always taught that that whole, you know, the shot comes through, strikes Hiram in the face, and uh, he, you know, falls back. I'm a dead man. Joseph comes up and grabs his brother and says, you know, something about I've lost my brother. But um, what Matt says makes more sense, right? Like if Hiram's up against the door or close to it, he gets shot. There should be damage to the face from wood splinters and other other things. Um the fact that he gets shot in the back first and then essentially falls to the ground and now someone reaches through, it makes a whole lot more sense for the shot than to go through the neck and up through the nose. And that seems like a much more rational explanation. Again, I'll point out what I said in the beginning. This contradicts the church's narrative. Randy, any thoughts from you? Yeah, all being said with the understanding, I'm not a ballistics expert, but just questions that run through my mind. Um, my, when I was in Carthage, I, like I say, I've been there at least twice, maybe three times. Uh, the the bullet hole is through the thinner panel door, and I, and that's that strikes me as uh, reconciling with my memory. And what I, I I had the same memory as you did, Bill, as terms of the the official church narrative. And I don't really have a strong opinion. I think in my um, non-expert view of what, what was explained to me there and then hearing what you've just shared, Bill, and what hearing what Matthew Steiner said, I, I just don't know. Um, I, think, I think they're both plausible. Um, the blood, I, this is some questions that kind of came up with the documentary is they were talking about a trajectory at five degrees or something. I didn't really track how, how that was playing out in terms of supporting or or disproving any particular narrative. But the, the paneling was pretty thin, and I would question if there was really enough depth to that to give the two points you would need to project a transjectory. But I don't know. I, th that's the bottom line. I, I really don't know, and I didn't see anything particularly compelling one way or another to lean one way or the other. And I just want to note, someone in the chat, RFM, is saying, I thought RFM said no exit wounds on Hiram. And that was when people were proposing that this was an entry wound and this, you know, the other side, this was an entry wound. Right. And hence, if there's two shots to Hiram's face and those are the only two holes we have, then we have two shots with no exit wounds. 
Right, there would be one out the back and one out the top if those yeah. were separate uh, bullet holes Correct. from two separate balls. Can we go back here? Because uh, something I just want to mention, I don't want to play the whole clip, but just the very first part of this clip, because it implies that there's something that's going to be in the full three hours that I'll be very interested in. And let me just go ahead and tell you what it is. There's a place here where Justin says to the expert, okay, well, you're going to tell me what your theory is. And do I get to push back on you or do I get to rip on your theory? Can we play that just, just up to that point? I think coming up my own theory is just another possibility. And there could some, a third person, fourth person, fifth person could come in with another possible theory. And then I'm going to rip you on yours if that's all right. Oh, sure. There we go. <laughs> Let me rip you on yours if that's all right. Okay, what that says to me is that there's a, a part of this conversation where the expert has been ripping on Justin's theory. That's obvious to me. Otherwise, there would be no reason for Justin to say, well, let me rip on your theory if that's all right, right? I want to see what it is the expert has to say in criticism of Justin's theory when we get the full three hours. I'd be very interested in hearing what it is he disagrees with about Justin's theory and why. Yeah, totally. Totally. Because, because again, we don't have all of it. There may be more evidence on Justin's side. There may be more evidence on Matt's side. There, as you pointed out, Randy, the report probably tells a lot more information. So we'd be interested. But he, just by the way, uh, Justin Griffin is in our chat and he's, that's who's on the front there who killed Joseph Smith. And he's just saying not correct. So I don't, he's saying essentially, I think that he hasn't cross-examined Matt's theory yet. Oh, okay. Well, I guess he'll be able to tell us, but I, I just, um, I don't know why it is that he'd be saying, let me rip on your yeah. theory. If it's okay, if I rip on your theory, if, if he didn't feel that, uh, Justin had already ripped on his. Yeah. And Justin, anyway. by the way, we do hope you call in at the end. We do have a call in time. And so yeah. maybe we can put you on the air for a few minutes. And I have a question that I'll want to pose to you, which I'll, I'll mention before we start taking the phone call. So you'll know what question it is that I'm really interested in seriously. Mm. Well, now we get to the last part of the clip that we're going to play, which is now where, um, after Justin's expert does not support his theory, in fact, the best thing he can say about it is it's possible. Now, Justin's going to take this as a victory. And I, Justin, I know you're watching, so I hope you'll take this with a sense of humor with which it is implied there's a scene that was spliced into your movie, and there's a reason for it, and I think you'll understand why. I think if you could continue to look at this, I've come up with some suggestions for you for further testing that you yep. can do. Some stuff that you can't do on your own, you're gonna need permission. But there's right. other experts out there that could look at the same thing and come up with another theory that's valid. Right. And then maybe they're gonna see something that I didn't see and that could be something that's important for the case. I still can't believe that I was sitting across the table from one of the most respected detectives in the entire country talking about the martyrdom. I had my doubts about how this was going to go. I always knew that my theory is possible, but to hear him say that, that was a cool moment. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! I read you. But, you know, obviously I haven't completely won him over. Not yet. There's still more work to do. Okay, so other than the obvious comedic thing that we threw in there, because really that's all his expert saying is, yeah, it's possible. And it seems that Justin's taken the victory lap over that as he's driving his vehicle down the darkened highway. Now, the thing that really interests me, though, is the last thing that Justin says, and this is going to form the basis for my question that I would really like to ask Justin if he's going to call in, and I hope he does, which is if, as you portray yourself as someone who's only after the truth and following the evidence wherever it leads, and you've given all the evidence that you have accumulated to an expert in the field, this is your expert. This isn't somebody else's expert. This isn't the expert for the other, you know, legal team. This is your own expert. And your own expert doesn't support your theory and just says, hey, it's possible. Why is it 
that you feel and you say that, well, you've got more work to do to bring him around to understanding that your theory is correct. Because to me, that doesn't sound like a person who's following the evidence where it leads. It sounds like a person who has already made up his mind what happened and is now going to force the evidence to fit that preconception. And I want to get your takes on that uh, first, Randy, then Bill. Yeah, I, I I can understand why the attorneys in the courtroom often ask me and ask the other experts, is this possible or is that possible? Because to somebody who isn't acclimated to the courtroom, they could they could um, they could take that in the wrong way and. I admire Justin, quite honestly. I think that uh, he's brave to take on, uh, you know, uh, a big established, uh, in air quotes, narrative. And I think he's, uh, I think it's admirable that he's willing to, to question all of that. But that all being said, I think that taking the, the phrase, it's possible, and then um, adding or concluding something beyond what that really means is kind of an overreach or, or an oversell. It, 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 like I said at the very beginning, uh, anything's possible. I would never take an absolute. Well, I just did it myself. I, I would <laughs> ever, you know, claim an absolute um, on, on something like that. You, you leave the door open to new evidence and rarely are absolutes. Uh, really absolute. <clears throat> it reminds me of this quote from Kerry Molstein. And again, I it just, no offense to Justin, I really enjoyed the documentary. And in the host of theories that Matt went over, he discarded multiple theories as impossible to him, not having been those, those ones we've eliminated. Uh, Justin's theory gets to sit on the table of possible theories. So on some level, it is a sort of a win. Um, but again, if we're going to focus on which theory best explains the evidence, his own expert thinks his own theory best explains the evidence. And it reminds me of this quote from Kerry Molstein. And so I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and uh, anything else, <clears throat> excuse me, that we get from uh, the restored gospel is true. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I don't feel that I need to defend that paradigm. I feel that I want to understand the evidence that I find within that paradigm because to me it's a given that it's true. There are others who will assume that it's not true, and on these points we'll just have to agree to disagree, but we will understand one another better when we understand how our beginning assumptions uh, color the way we, we filter all of the evidence that we find. He self-acknowledges that he has yet to win his own expert over, that he has to do more work to win that expert over. Now, this is his expert. And hence, if he hasn't won his expert over with five months of research on the part of the expert sitting down with all the data that Justin's collected, then at the very minimum, as an observer who isn't the expert, like you said in the beginning, I have to go with what the expert concludes and the expert hasn't been won over by Justin's information, evidence, and perspective. Right. And I would characterize it differently because my feeling is it's not a win to have your expert not contradict you. What it is is it's it's not a loss. Okay? Yeah. It's not a win in my mind, but it's not a loss. So that's a good thing. And I know Justin is uh, quote, making a lot of comments. At least I presume it's Justin. He's posting under the title, Who Killed Joseph Smith? So it's probably he. And I hope he does call, by the way, 662-667-6667. Or Justin, the easiest way is 662 and then hit Mormons with an S on the end on your phone. Right. And that's for anybody else who wants to call him. But of yeah. course, we'll put Justin at the beginning of the, yeah. uh, at the head of the, the list. I hope we've been respectful, except, of course, for the Dumb and Dumber clip, which you know, I couldn't resist, sorry. Um, but respectful as possible to all the work and effort that Justin's put into this. But Justin, if you call in, I just want you to know, I want to ask you, I, I would like for you to answer the question, why are you so sure that this was an inside job in spite of the fact that your own expert witness does not support you in that? 
and merely says it's possible, but even has his own theory that he likes better, which is an outside job. What is it? It's not the evidence, apparently. It's not the expertise, because that's in your expert witness, not in you, as you say at the beginning of the movie. You're not a historian. You're not a ballistics expert. That's why you hired this expert in the first place, was to get his opinion. Why is it that in spite of the expert opinion, that you continue to maintain doggedly your belief that this was an inside job and that John Taylor and Willard Richards were the ones who killed Joseph and Hiram. That's what I want to know because I don't understand that. And I hope you can explain that to me. Yeah, hopefully he'll call in. Otherwise, we do have a couple calls in the bank. And after each call, I'm more than happy to double check and see if he's in there. And we can uh, we can certainly put him to the front of the line. Okay, so let's go to that. All right, so the first one, it looks like it's going to be uh, Rebecca Biblioteca. And so let me just make sure I've got her here. Rebecca, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Randy. Hi, Bill. Hi, RFM. Good to are have you in you a well. Can you get closer to the phone or something? Oh, I'm really close to the phone. Can you not hear me? It's just kind of tinny. But that's okay. We'll try and be quiet and let you, by the way, I understand. And I think okay. I know that you've had Justin on your show before, right? I have, that's exactly right. No. And I kind of wanted to talk about that. And I also wanted to talk about the fact um, that I was lucky enough to attend the premiere of this movie in Lehigh. And that was just a couple, three weeks ago, right? Yeah, it was in January, exactly. And it was very last minute. Um, Justin was really wonderful. And um, through Steve Pinecker, he was able to get me and my Mormon co-host Landon tickets. So we went at the very last minute. And, and I'd like to say it was a packed theater. I don't think I've ever seen, like probably 500 plus feet. So my comment is there are many, many people that are very interested in this. They were literally riveted. You could hear a pin drop in that theater for the entire length of the movie. They were absolutely fascinated and riveted to that screen. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I also wanted to say that, yes, I have had the chance to interview Justin before. Hi, Justin. I know you're out there listening. And he was very clear uh, when I talked to him that he is open, as Randy, I think, brought up, um, to new evidence, um, to anybody's theory. He will talk to anybody about what they think happened, about evidence they may have, their take on it. So he is very open to exploring new ways of looking at things. So I think that's awesome. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for calling in and giving us that report. Yep, you are so welcome. Just By the way, Rebecca, do you want to plug Thank your... You. Hey, Rebecca, don't go. Don't go. You still there? Oh, okay. Do you I'm want to there. plug your podcast? Do you want to plug my podcast? Oh, my God. Well, last time you said that you couldn't uh, swing a dead cat without hitting me. So I think that you do owe me a little <laughs> No, I have Mormonist podcasts, um, and it's just a fun podcast check it out that's it and also the good book club so thanks for letting me do that thanks for you bet by the way it was very hard for the audience to hear it so All i'm right. going to repeat that her podcast uh which she does with oh, a co-host is called mormon ish it's mormon ish podcast and she also does this other podcast called the good book club where she reviews books with uh, other people it already um, sounds better than the not even once club <laughs> I, I understand that's the book that they're they're discussing this month <laughs> just kidding <laughs> No, it, it's uh, not. All right. So we do have Justin in the, the call bank. So I'm going to pull him up. Justin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sweet, my friend. Let me let me start off by saying I really enjoyed watching both these parts. And I think you did a fantastic job of putting this two-part, uh, I'll call it a documentary, together. Thanks. You guys are awesome tonight. I loved hearing your discussion. Perfect, my friend. What's so the, you're calling in. Was there a point that you wanted to make before I ask you my question? Um, it's up to you. It's up to you. Okay, then I'll go ahead and ask you. Why is it that you're so dead set on this being an inside job in spite of the fact that your own expert doesn't support that position? 
Well, I feel like um, what the win for me is, number one, the narrative, the current narrative is not correct. And I think that most people mm. would agree with that and the expert agreed with that. Yeah. And that narrative has been a conglomeration of mostly um, Willard and John's testimonies. It's not correct. And it can't be correct because they contradict each other on major details. So most of the people who've watched this walk away from it and say, yeah, the narrative is not correct. So my interest is to say, well, then what did happen? If we know the narrative isn't correct, then what did happen? And all I can really do is hope that people come up with theories and then we analyze them. There's no way to get to the truth any other way. And I'm inclined to agree with you guys. The forensic evidence trumps the eyewitness account always if you have both things. And so I'm like, I would rather go off of the forensic evidence. But I think people disagree about what the forensic evidence means. And I love those discussions. Mm. Well, good. So I'll follow up by asking. But anyway, why? here's what oh, I Justin? happened. Oh, Justin, I just want to well, ask you as a follow up. Are you there? I'm sorry. I don't mean to talk over you. But as a follow up, I wanted to ask, why is it that you disagree with your own expert's conclusion that this was an outside job? I, I said conclusion. I should say okay, his theory, what, his own theory that it was an outside job. He agrees that the hole through the door, through the panels, is not the shot that hit Hiram in the face. So do I. We also both agree that the shot that struck Hiram in the head entered his chin and exited out of the left of his nose. That's huge. That is such a win that we both agree on that. Now the question is, how was that shot made on Hiram? So I have run so many different scenarios about how you could shoot that shot, how you get that angle. And most of the people that I talk with that come up with theories about how that could happen. That's where I feel is the next useful level to discuss is how was that shot made? And originally in the original film, one of the shots could have been Hiram committed suicide. That matches the angle and it would have matched the motivation that they didn't want to tell that story to preserve his, you know, preserve what people thought of Hiram. So I'm like, that's a legit possibility. But the other theories that explain that shot coming through the chin and through the nose don't make a lot of sense. Someone had to have come in the, in the room to make that shot. Hiram didn't go outside of the room. So if someone was in the room when they made that shot, how the heck did Willard and John Taylor come up with this story that had nothing to do with that? So oh, Okay, Justin, so I'm, I'm just breaking it. All the time about... Right, Justin, I just got to break in to say, I understand that you and the expert agree on certain things, and I think that's great. But in spite of the things that you agree on, he still comes up with a theory where it's an outside job in opposition to your yep. theory that's an inside job. So I'm wondering why you're sticking with your theory in spite of the fact that your own expert believes that his theory because that it's an outside job is better. I believe that the, I believe the eyewitnesses were lying when they described that shot, and the detective doesn't. He says they were misremembering. That's why we did. So, so just really quick, and RFM, you can jump in if you want to take this point, because I know we've talked about it, and you were the one that mentioned this. But it seems just as rational or more that they're trying to create, with no malice in terms of them having done the job, it seems reasonable and rational that they would try to create a hero story, number one, and number two, as RFM pointed out off the air with me, that they would seek to protect their own perceived cowardice where Willard Richards is essentially scared and hiding behind the door. And John Taylor, the moment he gets hit, he rolls underneath the bed. And it seems reasonable that those two men would not want a story existing where they aren't fighting uh, for the life of the prophet and his brother. And... I think in other religions, such as Scientology and how they boost up L. Ron Hubbard's uh, perceived image, I think it's also rational that they would have been creating sort of a hero story. And I think that's just as reasonable, if not more, than saying that's got to be the key ingredient that they were maliciously taking the prophet and his brother's life themselves. 
What do you think about that, Justin? I love your analysis. I think that's, that's the kind of discussion that I love to have. Is okay. I think they were lying. You think, well, it sounds like you think they were lying, but your intent or why they were lying is different than mine. So the detectives like, I don't think they were lying. I think they were just misremembering. And I'm like, I don't think they were misremembering. I think they crafted a story. Now, why did they craft that story? In specific rebuttal to what you just said, why would John Taylor then it write into the story that he left Joseph to go jump out of the window and save himself? If he was trying to protect himself from being embarrassed, why did he put that into that story? Yeah, and I'll only follow up. I don't know that I can answer that, but I'll follow up by saying if John Taylor and Willard Richards were in that room with Joseph and Hiram with the intent to do an inside job and take their lives, suddenly then, as they've already got this plan figured out, they've got their guns, they've already got their instructions, or they've already come up with a plan themselves, suddenly there is a real and actual mob that is coming up the steps and about to do some sort of violence on everyone in the room, or at least some people. But if you're in the room, you're going to suppose it's everyone. Um, combined with that, um, you could make the argument like they're in their heads going, this is it. This gives us the perfect alibi. This is the perfect moment. But I think psychology would show us that in a moment of great distress, such as not being in that room and suddenly a mob is coming up the steps, you immediately are going to be in fight or flight and the ability to be calm and go like, oh, here's our moment. And man, isn't it amazing that we just got this perfect alibi that we weren't intending to have. We were going to take their lives, but now, and, and then we're going to have to figure out a way out of it. Now we've got this mob that can take the blame. And in the middle of this mob coming up, the distress and panic, the fight and flight, I find it really difficult to then pose, they go, perfect, pull out their guns, and they're like, this is the moment, and thank goodness this mob came, because yeah. now we can get out of this thing. I, the Your thoughts, Justin? Thing is, is I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think that they were, I don't think they were there with the intent to kill Joseph and Hiram. I don't think they conspired with the mob. I think what happened was in the moment they tried to save themselves. And one of the options to save themselves was to give up Joseph and Hiram to the mob. Now, most normal people wouldn't be willing to do that. So I think their motivation was twofold. First, they wanted to save themselves. The thought was, how can we save ourselves? Second was, well, we can save ourselves by throwing Joseph out of the window to the mob. But why would they do that? Unless they did already have a big problem with Joseph. Is there so any? I do think the mo motivation was multifaceted. I don't think they were there to kill him, but the opportunity came. They had to think quickly. It was a massive chaos, but their first instinct was to save themselves. Is there Just any evidence from? Is there any evidence from any witness that says they saw Willard Richards or John Taylor shoot Joseph Smith and Hiram? to give them up, to get themselves out of having violence enacted upon them? No. And out of the 73 accounts that I have, probably about 50 of them are fairly useful. The 73 accounts are people that talk about Carthage at, around that time period. The 53 are people that were there or spoke with somebody who was there or their family member was there. And out of those, there's about 20 that are pretty useful. There are only two eyewitnesses that were actually in the jail. Right. And one of them says they shot through the door and that struck Hiram. And it is impossible for him to have seen that. It is impossible. The door was shut when he made that shot. And as soon as it opened, Joseph was firing back at him and they were running down the stairs. So I've asked myself a million times, why did he say he killed Hiram with that shot. My only conclusion is Willard told him that story and he believed it. Okay, so I want to ask now, a question. I know that Randy, I'm sorry, Justin. That I analyzed. Sorry, Justin. I know Randy's been sorry. taking notes. He wants to get a couple questions in, but you said something I've got to follow up on. Sure. I think that I heard you say sure. that John Taylor and Willard Richards uh, would have had to have had, if, if they did what you believe they did, or your theory is, 
that they would have had to have had a big problem with Joseph to have done this. Did I hear you correctly? Because if yeah. so, I want to follow yeah. up and say, what yeah. was the big problem that you believe John Taylor and Willard Richards had with Joseph that would have led them to do such a horrible deed? Great question. So again, if, if you were in the room, I don't think you would have thrown Joseph to the mob. I think that might have crossed your mind. And most people would have said, I'm not going to kill someone else to save myself. So there had to be a, a whole other level of motivation for them to think that that was a good idea. And what do you so think I that think was? Before Carson, yeah, I think that Brigham, I think that John Taylor, Willard Richard were pissed with how Joseph was running the church. They didn't like it. Um, similar to anyone that has a job and is complaining about their boss and thinks their boss is doing a horrible job and they could do better. Along those lines. Yeah, one thing to complain about your boss, another thing to put a gun to his head and blow his brains out. But what is the problem that well, you think that yeah. John Taylor and Willard Richards had with Joseph Smith running the church? They believed that Joseph was doing it contrary to what God wanted. In what way? They could do it the way God wanted it run. That's what gave them the motivation to do it. Okay, that you're not answering the question, the so I'm going to suggest. High enough to kill it's because it all comes down to polygamy. Isn't that right? No, not for me. Not for well, me. then what was it's it? like a whole facet of different reasons that they thought. I think it's polygamy. I think it's power. I think it's influence. And a big one is the money. I think that they thought Joseph was a poor money manager and they could do a much better job. Well, uh, once again, we'll, I think we'll have agreement on the idea that Joseph Smith was definitely a poor money manager. But I'm not sure that that means it was an inside job. Yes. See, an agreement on certain peripheral issues doesn't equate to cold-blooded murder. Okay, and again, I agree with you, and I also agree I don't have the evidence that proves this in a court. But, the and so I agree with you guys, but I, the counter to that is no one else does either. None of the other theories could be proven in court. And in fact, I've already disproven all of them, and Matt agreed with that. So New why do you believe that your theory, so which like, can't... okay, all I can do is test this now. Okay, Justin, so why is it that you believe that your theory, which you admit cannot be proven in court, must be the correct one? Well, I again, I don't think I'm 100% correct on my theory. It only remains as a possibility there could be a theory tomorrow that comes out that is way more likely. Did, hey, so, but what I've done by trying to prove my theory and test other theories is come up with solid evidence. And the evidence is that shot through the door didn't strike Hiram. That is such a huge step forward in trying to figure out what happened. That's what I was so excited about with the detective is we both agreed no, this shot came through the chin and exited the nose. It didn't come through the door. Now the next reiterate, the next level is then how was that shot made? And I would love to hear as many people, and there are, there have been three or four or five different theories of that shot coming to the, through the chin and exiting the nose that have come to me. And I'm start, all you can do is start to analyze each one of them. Let, let me ask you, Justin, did your expert, your, it seems as though, and I don't want to put words in his mouth or yours, it seems as though your expert accounted for the shot angle of Hiram Smith's, the entry wound at the chin, the exit wound at the nose, and your expert witness proposed that that is best explained by somebody pointing a gun through the door. Yes. Or so through the doorway. Again, yeah, we doorway. agree that that we agree that that shot came from someone behind Hiram. So why I have a problem with his theory is that shot through the door that hit his back first. First of all, that shot in the door is too high. It's too high to hit where Hiram was struck. But your expert doesn't Second think of all, so, right? No blood around that wound. Your your expert didn't, didn't think know so. That. Though. He, he didn't, didn't know what? Know that. He didn't know. I discovered that after our conversation. What didn't he know? Yeah, I, I had this picture of me against the door, and I was like, oh, the bullet hole's too high to have hit him in the back, especially if he was leaning into the door. That would have made it even higher on his back. But the expert did know that the big problem with his theory is there's no blood in the clothing. That's the part where he couldn't overcome. And that's the part 
that if you remember in the first movie, the final theory from Gary Smith is no blood in the back of that is a big detail. He's the one that owns that clothing. So I'm like, we need to get people to analyze that clothing and see what is there no speck of blood on that or not. But I can't get permission from the church to do that. But if there's no blood there, then you have to explain how that could have been the first shot and there wasn't blood pouring out of it into that clothing there. That's why I, I don't agree with him. Okay. But he didn't know the fact that he didn't look at the clothes as part of his examination? No, he did. And he knew that that was a problem. I just didn't put that part in the in the movie where he explains, yeah, I know, I know that's a problem. So it's the same thing with Sam Weston. Sam Weston believes that Hiram was shot in the back first. And so he's come up with an elaborate explanation for why there's no blood. And what he is saying is that Joseph and Hiram, after they laid in those closings all night and the blood dried, then when they shipped them home in Nauvoo, they put ice in their caskets and that ice is essentially the blood was sitting on the ice and that's what washed it out. That's his theory. What the, what the Lion brothers know, this is a huge problem too. And their theory is, well, the family just scrubbed that out. They scrubbed all that blood out. And Gary Smith, of course, is like, that's impossible. And the pathologist that he got said, that's impossible. And why would they scrub that part out and not the part on the upper shirt? So the detective can't explain that part. Other than that, I thought he had a great theory. Because, yeah, we both agree that that shot came from behind on higher. So we're headed in the right direction. And as you guys keep analyzing this and new people, and I'm trying to get new experts, I feel like, again, the more theories that come, the more we analyze, we'll start to get closer and closer to the truth. That's my goal. I've heard that you're trying to get John Taylor's body exhumed for testing. Is that true? So I originally thought that might be good. Clark Abu, the one that I interviewed on my podcast a week or two ago, is mm -hmm. doing a petition for that now. I think if you exhume his body and see the bullet that's left in his knee that he claims he left in his knee, if you could match that to the ballistics of Joseph's gun, that would be incredible evidence. But then I realized, eh, the church will just say it was an accident. Or we don't know that Joseph did that. Or I'm like, so if you do all that work, what's that going to prove kind of is my thought. Right, and that's but certainly a calculation you have to make before you... Yeah, there's certainly a calculation you have to make as to whether whatever you find is going to prove your case or just sort of be both ways. You know, my experience has been 33 years as an yeah. attorney that the vast yeah. amount of evidence can be interpreted both ways. It's rare, but very valuable when you can get evidence that can be interpreted only one way. Yeah, my, if we were going to dig someone up, I'd rather dig up Hiram or let me use the word exhume so that it sounds a little more respectful for all these people involved. Yeah. But Hiram was shot in the, his knee as well, and I and there should be damage from that. If there's no damage to his knee and no ball there, that's when I'm like, oh, there's another piece of evidence that shows the narrative was a lie. It wasn't just misremembering, it was a lie. I want to turn this over to Randy for a second because he's been making notes furiously. But the thing I'm still left with is even <laughs> if there's a narrative problem, and I agree that there is, I mean, there's a narrative problem, things don't match up, in a host of different ways. But why is it that, that all that adds up to it was an inside job? That's the part I'm having trouble with. Uh, I just want to tell you that. And now I'm going to turn over to Randy and let him ask you some questions. Please answer my question yeah. or Randy's questions, whatever you want, Justin, okay? Uh, well, yeah, I'd love to hear from Randy. Yeah, Justin, I, first of all, I got to just say, I think everything, uh, something that we all agree on is that the theories you're bringing forward in your documentary are very fascinating, very interesting. And I want to compliment you on the courage to ask tough questions and stay open to the evidence and have these conversations. And I also noticed your comment where you got a laugh out of that dumb and dumber quote. So I, I can tell you're a, a good guy by, by maintaining a sense of humor. I, I, the second thing I want to say is that and I, I take this in a in a positive way, but going into the courtroom where there's a, the, the client or the attorney doesn't align with the expert is a recipe for disaster in the courtroom. And I think you probably appreciate 
that right. point at this point uh, in the conversation. But the, the third point I want to make is something I think you might find helpful as you kind of keep, because obviously you're, you're still going after the, uh, the information. John Taylor, and I, you didn't mention the documentary, but I have this book in my library uh, and I've had it for years. The uh, Witnesses to the Martyrdom, written by John Taylor. Um, one of the rules, in, at least in California state court, and, and I think there are similar, well, in fact, I know there are similar uh, rules of evidence in other states. And that is, if you can impeach a, a witness on one point, uh, then you can dismiss the entirety of their testimony. Um, that's a jury instruction. And John Taylor can certainly be impeached in terms of his credibility on numerous points. Um, he, he, in 1850, he told a whole crowd of people, and it was documented, that the church did not practice polygamy. And at the time, he, I think he had at least 12 wives. So the guy is not prone to telling the <laughs> truth. <laughs> And, right. and, and he, a lot of people don't realize this, but the author of this book, this whole account of the martyrdom written by John Taylor, John Taylor died as a criminal fugitive. So I, I think uh, that's a point that didn't come out in your documentary, but I think really kind of helps your case. And that is the reality. We can indict, uh, dismiss the entirety of John Taylor's testimony based upon his lack of credibility in other cases where he clearly was not uh, truthful. So those are my comments. There, I really don't have a question for you, but just some things that, uh, some observations that hopefully you'll find constructive. Yeah, I do. And I'll, I'll tell you guys, I didn't know the courtroom stuff. I don't know any of that. I literally believe, and my wife believes, the detective could have said X, Y, Z, and it disproved our case. Listening to your discussion and after having talked with the detective, now I know that would be a really hard thing to do. And that's why he uses words like possible and likely and whatnot. But I believe it. I believe that he could have seen something in a way and that disproved similar to the way we disproved the others. And I had to deal with that. What are we going to do? You know, if he disproved this, I'm not hiding from it. I'll tell the world this is what he came up with. And right along with that, I, I would have hoped that that meant that he did know what happened and he could present the case that could have been proven in court. Mm -hmm. But that didn't, that didn't happen either. So I wasn't trying to impeach John in order to win uh, a court case, but I was trying to show, I think within John's testimony, there are certain facts or certain evidence that helps us figure out what really happened in the two to three minutes. And I'm like, John purposely lied about his wound. He, he didn't describe the wound to Hiram the way Willard did, but he lied about his own experience. He said he went to the window. Ten people were standing outside of the jail talking about Joseph coming to the window. None of them mentioned John going to the window. I'm like, he said that the shot that hit his leg flattened out to a size of a quarter. It's impossible. That would have been a 69 caliber gun. It would have blown his leg off. He lied about all four of his wounds. So I'm just like, why is this guy lying so much? And why did Wheeler lie about his description? Why did they, the watch I didn't care about. The watch, I'm like, yeah, he didn't know. And then I'm saying to the detective, dude, how do you get, say you got blown back into the window from a shot we both agree that never happened is that a lie or is that a misremember and he said uh that was a misremember and i'm like how is that a misremember that you're falling out of the window and get blown back into the room so again and again i'm like why is john lying about all of this stuff why is willard lying that's rsm the answer to your question why i'm like that's why I lean towards the inside job is they lied so much about what happened in there. Why would you lie about it? Yeah. I, I, why would Willard, who's supposed to be the dang historian, not tell it like it was? That's his yeah. one job. I, I, to I, explain exactly what happened that day. The witness they were supposed to be of Joseph, and he, they come up with these wild stories that have nothing to do with the forensic evidence. Justin, you're asking That's why a why church. I'm still passionate about it. Yeah, you're asking why a church historian wouldn't tell the story accurately. And I'm just going to say for 200 years, church historians haven't been telling the story accurately. RFM and I off the air 
were noting the whole thing about John Taylor not really saying that a bullet struck him and knocked him back in, just that some force did. And as RFM and I are talking off the air, and again, RFM is, is a lawyer by trade, um, we both proposed and agreed with each other that what we thought was the best explanation for it was because both John Taylor and Willard Richards, uh, out of fear or whatnot, avoided conflict in that room. I mean, we have stories that tell us Willard Richards is behind the door. Of course, he wants to propose that he's striking guns with his cane or whatnot. But um, the reality is that it seems that both him and John Taylor could have easily been avoiding the conflict. Uh, John Taylor does end up, as by his own words, going under the bed. Yeah. Willard Richards, by his own words, ends up behind the door. And it might be best explained that they had some fear of being seen as cowards and hence told the story in yeah. a way as to protect their image. And I think that's also uh, a tenable explanation. Yeah, Justin, I I'll just tell you personally. Theory. I absolutely agree with that. If, I, if I'm in that room, I'm behind the door with Willard. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, under the, I'm under the bed with John. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not going to be out there He's sword fighting and with muskets. And, and again, the criterion of embarrassment, yes. the fact that Willard Richard puts himself behind the door and the fact that John Taylor puts himself under the bed actually lends credibility that that's where both of them were. Yes. Yes. So, so again, I, I, I love your theory. I definitely think that's a possibility. But now you have to explain what happened in the two to three minutes, which it gets a little bit more difficult. Because with them hiding and them under the bed, there's nobody shooting Joseph in the room anymore. Nobody shooting Hiram. Because that wasn't the mob. Or it wasn't the mob when they first came up. So a lot of the eyewitnesses argue. Some say Joseph was shot in the room. Some say he wasn't shot until he came out of the jail. Some say it was both. Some say it was neither. They all contradict each other. So, yes, I like your discussion of motive. I think it's really good. Hey, Justin, let me ask you a question. One thing that wasn't clear when I listened or watched your documentary, and that was uh, your expert, Matt, said that there he disagreed that the bullet coming through the door couldn't have hit uh, Joseph or Hiram Smith uh, through the neck and out through the nose. And and the what the reason I heard, and I, I'm asking you this question to clar clarify this for me, was that there wasn't enough uh, shrapnel or or wood fragments. To, to justify that, I'm wondering what that's based on because the the bodies have decomposed. You know, when they were reinterred, uh, it, it was just skeletons, and also that was the panel portion of the door where there's very little wood fragments. Can you kind of put a little more explanation on on why he came to that conclusion? It's the face mask and the lack of damage to the face mask and the lack of damage to the underlying skull. And the fact that there's no exit wound. So what he said was, there's, he wasn't shot at the door because there would have been damage from the splintering. And I proved in my test, that's absolutely correct. But he wasn't shot 10 feet away from the door, like Willard said, either, because there would have been an exit to the back of his skull. Both of those we proved extensively with our ballistic testing. Now, can you get that shot through the door in a way that hits him under the chin and exits out of the nose? I mean, you come up with a scenario where that's possible and I'll listen. I haven't been able in every possible way I've twisted his body around to figure out an angle where that's possible. Do you want to hear my theory? Some people... Wait, say again. Do you want to hear my theory? Yeah, of course. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> There's dispute about which is the entry and which is the exit wound, in spite of what the coroner said. You go along with the coroner. See, I did actually watch the movies. Uh, yeah. But uh, there's some dispute about which is the exit and which is the uh, entrance wound on Hiram. Because I think your whole case centers on Hiram and the in and the wounds to his body. There's a lot of other stuff that's kind of yeah, circulating out there. But as I see your theory as you present it in your movies, it really focuses on the injuries to Hiram. So here's what I'm going to suggest, okay? Yeah. This is the entry wound, and I probably have it on the wrong side. It should be here. And this is the exit wound here. And the reason that, and the way it comes about is simply that Hiram is at the door with other people at a door, which is made out of wood, which apparently the latch doesn't even work. I mean, can you imagine how, oh, 
It's just what a terrible team. What a great Imagine prison the situation huh? they were in. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they were in the nice exclusive, the jailer's bedroom. So they've got this nice wooden door that doesn't even latch or have a lock on it. But Hiram is at the door with others, but he's at the door trying to hold it closed, but he's not up against it like that. What he's doing is he's down low, his arms are extended, and his head is down, just like if you're pushing a car. His head is down, his arms are extended, and it's that angle that gets it far enough away from the door to avoid the wood damage, but allows the shot to come in through the nose and out through the underside of his chin. That's my theory for now. It's a, just a working theory I've got going. Okay. So your theory is the Lion Brothers theory. That's exactly what the Lion Brothers said. And your and response to it was, well, why, why don't we so have easily... an injury on his body? Right? Yes. No, there's two responses. So the one I put in the first movie is, yes, if that was the shot, it would have hit him somewhere in his body. But he does but have other bullet wounds in his is... body, right? But not not anywhere on the front of his torso. There's one in but the down back, on his leg, one on his right hip, and one in his left knee. Why couldn't that be the same bullet that went through the door, through his nose, out the b bottom part of his jaw, and hit another part of his body? Then, if it had to hit his body, well, again, I've put that angle together against the door a million times. It would have hit him around his collarbone, like right now. Tilt. I, I can't see you, but tilt your head down. Because no your way. head would have to be tilted down. Look, if you had hair like now mine, imagine... you wouldn't you wouldn't tilt your head down <laughs> on a live right. show either, Maybe okay? Bill or Randall can tilt it. Bill, Bill, you tilt Randall your head down. Their head down. <laughs> they could show the exit would hit right around the neck collarbone area. That That's the only way that shot could have made is if his head was tilted. Bill, like that, yes. If but no, he's gonna, leaning. He's, he's at an angle. His head, head is at the same. <laughs> his when head is at the same over. angle as his body, and it's his legs that are now. I mean, you're pushing a car. You're trying to push this thing closed, and so your your head is at the same <laughs> angle as your body, and then it's your leg. I mean, I think this is such a this is such a dynamic <laughs> situation that I think that this uh, discussion. Now, and I'm, st I'm still leaning with bigger, my theory. By the way, I think it's also possible that bullet would have hit nothing and would have gone past and hit the floor or hit. Something else, you know? It, yeah, it's so dynamic. And I think that's one that's of the reasons that yeah. Matt Stein says, you know. He could have been turned to his it. side. I mean, you know what I mean? He could have been in the side into the door, but also kneeled down. Like RFM is saying, I, I think there's so many variables. Okay, let me let me conclude. Yeah, please. please. We don't go on all night. We'll give, you the, we'll give you the final word here. This discussion, this discussion is what I love. I think we all agree the narrative is bunk. The yeah. the window narrative of him being blown out of the window back into the room, the church says that was a miracle. Most people say that's a miracle, and I believe in miracles. I told the miracle theory to Matt. You sexy and he thing. Was like, no. <laughs> he was like, no. So I love these discussions. This is what I want. Every time when we discuss this with people who are legitimately trying to think it out and think it through in their minds, something comes up I hadn't considered before, and I'm like, maybe that's right. And then I actually, I don't just listen to you. I go run that test. I'm like, all right, I think I've simulated what you're saying. Here's what, here's what eventually happened. By doing that, I've just proved a million things that I thought. Mm -hmm. One of the big, for example, I thought there was no way the mob could shoot from outside of the jail accurately into that window i thought there would have to be some shots that hit the stone but we went and tested it a hundred yards away we shot with an 80 grand 69 caliber musket and nailed the target so i was like oh crap i guess we were more accurate than i thought i totally disproved myself on that and that's the thing is any test that i ran i'm like anyone can run this i'm not hiding it I may interpret it differently than you, but you can go do the same test as me. You'll see the same things I came up with. Okay, I and I appreciate that. So that's in any future line. movie. Thank you guys for talking about it. Justin, your, your ace is in my book. Um, in any future movie where you talk about the extended arms with Hiram at the door, please call that the Radio Free Mormon Theory. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> is that okay? Because that's going to be the all winner. Right, that's going to be it. I'm telling you right now. Old Jerry. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you, uh, Justin. Thank you. I appreciate Great stuff, you. I appreciate by the way. your Thanks work. Thanks for calling. You bet, guys. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. All right. So we uh, we have a couple other calls 
Um, Who's going to follow Justin? I think it's going to be Clark who actually wanted to talk, I think, to Justin. Clark, are you there? I'm here. Okay, Clark, so we, I'm, I'm sorry um, we didn't put you on with them. We wanted to make sure we took advantage of, of Justin's time. Um, and I didn't know if we could put two calls on at once, and I didn't want to risk losing him. But what are your thoughts, my friend? <laughs> um, so I am working on a, a petition for a gaming John Taylor, 350 signatures so far. But um, I do want to talk about the forensics and the expert. What he Clark, has I want to hear what you have to but, say, um, but I've got to ask you. Three... Clark, Clark, when you make a petition to exhume John yeah. Taylor's body, who is that petition made to? Um, I'm going to be sending it to the Illinois uh, police and the attorney general. Okay, because you're going to have to go in front of a judge at some point, right, to get a court order to exhume a body. Is that your understanding? Uh, the police would be. The, my understanding is the police are able to do it as well. Well, I don't know. I don't know what goes on. I just know that there's one case that I'm aware of in my local jurisdiction where a body of a victim was exhumed after the fact because, oops, they didn't do all the testing on it that they should have done, and there was additional testing, and they had to go through a court to get a court order to exhume a body. Um, so you you got a petition. you got 350 signatures on it. How many signatures are you trying to get before you send it in? I'm trying to get 1,000 right now. Okay. Do you think that actually has any reasonable likelihood of ge uh, getting this body exhumed? Well, I'm sending them my, my um, paperwork as well. I've been putting together the historical account that shows there's plausible, um, that it's plausible that they were behind the murder. Um, okay. So will you tell us, I know you put a comment up on the screen, Clark. I know you put a comment up on the screen. Would you tell the audience what it is that you hope to accomplish by getting John Taylor's body exhumed? What evidence do you think that's going to show? Well, the bullet it would still be in his, um, below his knee. The toe markings on it would possibly be um, compared to the guns that they believe, the church believes are the guns that Justice Smith used. And it'd be like um, the Delphi case where they, they compare to, uh, bullet markings to the gun to see if it's a match. And then from there, um, let people decide what they believe after that. Um, but the goal is for John Taylor's bones to be examined, if there's any remains of marks from the gunfire to his body, and then, the, of course, the bullet itself. And the caliber of the bullet, is it a 69 caliber? Is it like a 31 caliber? What is it? So you've come up with your own theory. Obviously, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you, if you can give us a thumbnail of that. And the main question I have is, does your theory agree with Justin's? Because I understand in some respects it does not. Um, yeah, so I believe the gunshot through the door happened after uh, Willard Richards and John Taylor left the room. So I believe that, um, so Tyron Smith died with his back to the door and he died with his head one to two feet from the door, according to the martyrdom account draft on page 54. And so he, he was away from the middle of the room. So the forensic guy um, has him being shot in the middle of the room, but his body is uh, all the way up against that wall basically on the east side but basically Hiram was looking out the window or something and John Taylor comes up from behind him and according to Will and Richard to the coroner um, Hiram died from a broken neck not from blood loss not from anything else but from a broken neck okay so wait a second John wait Taylor a second Hiram's you're neck. introducing something new into the conversation yeah. I've never heard before Clark so I appreciate this are you saying that the coroner who did the coroner who did the autopsy on Hiram Smith says in his coroner's report that Hiram died from a broken neck? Yeah, that's in Thomas L. Barnes, coroner of Carthage by Stanley B. Kimball. Okay, so it's in a book. You don't, do you have access to the actual report, the original document? Yeah, it's, it's on BYU. If you, you can just search the name of the document and you can pull it up. But okay. he also mentions that Willard Richards says that he was in the floor hinges. And Willard Richards' account, he says that he's to the left of the door. So Willard Richards has two different places where he places himself. And at one point in his testimony to the church, him and Joseph Smith run to the corner of the room 
and there, John Taylor had already been shot. Hiram was already shot, and the door is wide open for anyone that wanted to come in. So when is it that Hiram gets his neck broken? Because it has to happen before he gets shot in the hold head, on, right? Hold on, I've got a whole new yeah. theory now, which is so, that I, Willard Richards I, takes I, the neck. I know it's like Don Cheadle talking about going back in time and taking care of Thanos when he's a baby. <laughs> Sorry, when I'm does the neck get those movies again? But but really, when does he get? Obviously, he has to be his neck has to be broken before he gets shot in the head because that shot in the head is going to kill him if his neck isn't broken first. And he never falls out the window, yeah, so, so we can't say he hits the ground. Yeah, go ahead, Clark. I'm sorry. It sounds like we're ganging up on okay. you, and I apologize. Go ahead. Okay. So the gunshot to the head isn't like a guaranteed fatality. So I believe to make sure he was going to die would be to break his neck. And in the draft account of martyrdom, it mentions that uh, Hiram fired his single uh, pistol. It's only mentioned in that account. But I believe Hiram did shoot uh, John Taylor in the knee. And so with John Taylor's injury, he was still able to overpower uh, Hiram. Okay, so how does the neck get broken? Do you have a theory for that? Um, I just believe he put him in a, a, a choker hold from behind and was able to suffocate him and break his neck. Okay, that's a pretty, that's a really difficult thing to do. I know a lot of times on movies, you go up and you go, Tomp, it, and the neck is, breaks, right? But, yeah, it is, but it's it's a weird detail that Willard Richards would say he died from a broken neck. That's something like a deep, like the cops would hold back a detail of how someone was murdered so that they wouldn't have false uh, confessions. And just the fact of a broken neck is just a weird uh, detail. I agree with you. It is a weird detail, which is why I'm asking all these questions about it. Um, not trying to make yeah. light, okay? Because I know um, you put a lot of time and effort in on this. Hey, Rand, did you have any follow-up questions? You've yeah. been uncharacteristically quiet. I, I've just been fascinated with the conversation. So kudos to you guys. Kudos to Justin. And uh, I've just I enjoyed being part of it. Sweet. Thanks, my um, friend. I would like to make nice dodge, video, Randy. Because um, <laughs> I don't want to run out of time. You don't, Too late. You don't want to run out of time. So, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. yeah, as I say, we're at 8.30, my friend. We we're are winding down. Pass. Can you do a one-minute summary, and then okay. uh, we'll let you have the final word like we did with Justin. Okay. Okay, so basically, I believe Will, Willard Richard shows sign of premeditation. He stopped jur uh, journaling for Joseph on June 22nd, which he did daily for a year and a half. And then after Joseph and Hiram are dead, he is signing licenses under the authority of the 12 apostles, while Samuel Smith is still alive without health issues. So I believe that shows premeditation of the murder of Samuel and, in effect, Joseph and Hiram. Um, and then J John Taylor mentions that he had guns with him on June 21st in the Hamilton Hotel. He mentions having pistols under his pillow. John Taylor's martyrdom account, page 20. Governor Ford says he didn't have them search for weapons when he took them to Carthage Jail. That's history, 1838 to 1856, volume F, 1, page 195. And so, um, let's see. Um, uh, Willard, Willard Richard says he was shot in the ear at the window. Um, William Daniels, in his account, says no gunshots were fired through that window at Joseph or after. And so I believe... Willard Richards was shot by Joseph Smith in that year. And the mention of the ear shot is in the Martin account, page 66. And then BNC 135 says Joseph was shot after he was dead. There's no account of that um, in William Daniels or Willard Richards' account of him being shot after. And there's a gunshot to Joseph's heart that isn't mentioned by the coroner. The coroner's uh, jury verdict is mentioned in the Ogden Daily Standard, July 9th, 1901. And there's no 1901. To the heart, but it is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. So they, yeah, they took a copy of the the coroner's jury verdict and they published it in the Ogden Daily uh, Standard. And so, um, okay, there's a mention of the gunshot to the heart later on in the accounts, but that gunshot couldn't have come from the mob, and so it's a bit unclear where Joseph's gunshot to the heart happened. Okay, Clark, I, ho I hope you'll understand if, you, I, if I feel like we've been playing a game of Mormon Clue tonight. Okay. You know, Willard Richards did it in the, 
what in the study with the with candlestick. The candlestick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, you're a good sport. Thank you for calling in. I appreciate it, Clark. Good luck on your petition. And I hope you do get the thousand. I hope, I'd love to see where it goes. You get John Taylor's body exhumed. If that happens, we'll be there live at the graveside. <laughs> Have a great day, my friend. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Man, well, this has I... been great tonight. I'm so glad that Justin called in. I'm also glad that uh, uh, Clark Abood called in. And, Were there any uh, in 1844? I'm sorry, was there what? Were there Navy SEALs in 1844? I don't know, because I got a feeling. I mean, honestly, uh, with friends like this, who needs an enema? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got John Taylor, you got Willard Richards, oh. and you're getting attacked by an outside mob, and they decide this is a good time to cut their force in half by killing two of their own team. I want to talk to the member of the mob who snapped Hiram's neck. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Dwayne the Rock Johnson could do that easy enough. Yeah, screw the muskets. I'm just going <laughs> to break this guy's neck with my bare hands. And he's already dying from a from a fatal wound, you know? No, no, no. That that wound had to be after. No, no, actually, you're right. That was my impression. That's a kill that's a death shot, okay? That's a death <laughs> shot. Whether it's one or two on higher, that's a death shot. But you're right. Clark was saying that it was not necessarily and so his neck was broken. Just to make sure. Yeah. I'll tell you this much. Whoever Boy. stuck around listening to Mormon stories and missed all of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joke's on you. <laughs> this is the uh, place to be. We do have one more call. I want to make sure that we get it in. Why? Uh, so I'm going to try to be short here. I don't. What's the name caller? Hey, the last Goonie. The last Goonie. Goonies oh, never say Goonie. die, my friend. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, What's your theory? Films and uh, well, I'll tell you what Susan Easton Black told me back when I was her student at BYU in 2005. And this is after class. She pulled me aside because oh, I pulled her aside because I wanted to talk more about it. But she, her theory is that the mob was full of masons, and their motive to take out Joseph was to carry out uh, basically a, a blood oath penalty on him for revealing the endowment to women. Yeah. I had one of those yeah, after class meetings with Susan Easton black too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Everybody's yeah. got well, a theory uh, except for the obvious thing that people are pissed off that he had a press destroyed in the United States of America and was on trial for, or was being held on trial for treason. And that he was sleeping with 14 year old girls. Exactly. Well, regardless <laughs> of the conclusion here, it's about, you know, what you alluded to, Bill, earlier, the church history stories that I was told, none of them has stood up to any scrutiny, whether it's Not a the first vision. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, none of them really have. But, um, hey, I, I missed uh, last week, but I do want to ask RFM what you think of Canada's greatest rendition of Hamlet. And I'm talking, of course, about Strange Brew. Canada has no great rendition of anything. <laughs> Whereas Homer Simpson likes, or Homer Simpson likes to call it Canada, America Junior. You've offended <laughs> all ten of our Canadian listeners. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but I think they all know what I'm talking about, really, in their heart. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This is this wonderful spirit of esprit de corps that we have between our two great nations that have worked together and fought together, and um, all those other kind of things that I'm saying that I don't really mean. <laughs> I wish I wish we were still using copyrighted music because I'd play Digging Up Bones. I think it's Randy Travis, maybe, who sang that old country. I play the theme from Team America. Okay, what's that? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a family show. <laughs> After you get uh, done watching Who Killed Joseph Smith, watch Team America. Yeah, thank thank you, uh, the last Goonie. Remember, Goonies never say die. Amen. Okay, have fun. I'm glad we had that call. So I think we're done. Yeah. Yeah. Shimanachu 2006. Shimanchu 2006 knows Team America. They say, F yeah. Except that's not exactly what they said. Only in the clean flicks version. America, F yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's already people putting it in the comments. Everybody this was a lot of fun. Team I'm... America, yeah. 
I'm so glad you chose this topic. And I think Justin really enjoyed it. I think it was fun to, to kind of play this out in terms of what words mean. And I think it also shines a light on sort of how apologetics works and when you create plausible deniability or deny or deniable plausibility. Yeah, you're totally confused now. <laughs> I was confused. Actually, you got me with. confused. I just didn't know it. <laughs> it's plausible deniability. And you keep saying deniable plausibility. And I'm yeah, going, everyone knows writer? what I mean. Okay. I've never been a stickler for words in order. You know what I mean? Hi, Heather Reddick. <laughs> hey, you guys. Rocky Road ice cream. I'm going to go get some Rocky Road ice cream. Matt Damon. <laughs> durka, durka, durka. <laughs> Uh, Randy, thanks so much. This is a, it was fun to have you kind of give us your point of view as an expert witness in cases. I think that played a big part too. So thank you. Hey, hey thanks, Billy. <clears throat> they say you, you leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. The thing is, my uh, in this account of the martyrdom, I have two great grandfathers uh, discussed by John Taylor. So this isn't church history. It's family church, uh, family history, and I'm never leaving it alone. This is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, thank you for being here tonight, Randy. It's a pleasure as always. We appreciate your expertise. Bill, you're wonderful. Maven, are you going to come on the screen just so I can thank you? Mano a mano, which I think means hand to hand. No, I don't. I always thought it was man to man. I know it's a common misunderstanding. Oh, okay. Like, plausible I just want to make it clear. I wasn't saying man to man. <laughs> I'm saying hand to hand. Okay. <laughs> Pretty soon it's going to be hand to hand combat and somebody's going to get their neck busted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both going to do it. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, a you guys. Show tonight. Have Thank a great you, time. Maven, for making it all work and for taking care of all those clips and yep. getting them, uh, you know, all the work that you do to make that happen. I really appreciate it. I know it wasn't easy for you because you were doing like overtime before the show started with uh, John. De By the way, is that John DeLynn show? The, is it uh, over yet? Is it in the Mormonism Live affiliate? Is that still right. going? <laughs> no, no, it ended. <laughs> <laughs> ended early. I'm not sure when. <laughs> it ended early, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. Well, thank well, you so much. There were people much. in the chat wanting five hours, and I was like, maybe you guys do, but but I don't. No, no, I'm exhausted. <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm going to break my own neck. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> That's All not right, easy I'm just, to do either. I'm just curious what the kid's going to ask mommy. Mommy, how hard is it?